Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very happy to be here today in Barcelona. I'm here to talk about testing. But before I start, uh, allow me to introduce myself briefly. My name is Jan Stenki. I'm originally from Warsaw, a city in Poland, a beautiful place I recommend a visit. It's lovely this time of the year. I, I've been using Clojure since uh, 2010, and I work at uh, Stylefoods in Munich, mostly on the back-end side of systems. Let's talk about testing. The testing culture is quite strong in the Clojure community. When you generate your new project, typically with Leiningen, you get one test for free as part of the project skeleton. And to make matters worse, the test fails and you have to fix it. This is good. But why do we test things automatically? We have the REPL, right? We could just take all of our test expressions and put them directly into the REPL and validate whether everything works as expected or it doesn't. We don't do this because just like sequences in our favorite language, we are lazy. And it's a good thing. It's a very good thing. We take things which are easy and can be automated and let computers do it for us. And keeping this automation and laziness in mind, let's dig into the world of properties, the core concept of property-based testing. Let's start with a very simple example. Division. Let's assume we have an arithmetic library we want to test, and we start with the division operator. We could write the following um, closure, uh, closure test, test case, which checks whether division of integers works as expected, whether division of a double and an integer works as expected, and finally, whether arithmetic exception is thrown when it should be thrown. My question is, is this enough? Is this enough to be sure that our library is properly implemented? If not, how many more tests do we need? Do we need 10 more, 100 more, 1,000 more? It's, it's difficult to judge. Instead, let's see how we can refactor this test a bit. Uh, let's notice that if we forget about the arithmetic exception case, we can use the R macro and um, take the, extract the test expression to one line and then just keep specifying more and more input values until we're sure that our implementation is right. Now let's do some mathematics. A over B equals A over B. Let's multiply both sides of this equation by B and simplify the right side. If we express this equation in plain English, we end up with something which looks as follows. This property should hold for division in general. Property, keyword. Let's take this property and put it into our test. What we have here is something a bit different. Notice that this time, our test cases do not have to have results specified. We just specify input values, and we don't care about the output value. We just care that this property holds for every single input value. Wouldn't it make then sense to have those things generated for us for free so that for arbitrary A's and arbitrary B's, property holds? It turns out that this is exactly what um, Quick Check is all about. Originally introduced in a paper from 1999, um, Quick Check for Haskell was quickly ported to other languages and is available, among other um, things, for closure. Let's see how we could use test check in order to improve our tests of uh, the arithmetic library. Let's require test check, the um, closure port of the, one of the closure ports of the quick check method, and require a couple of namespaces. We will need the core test check namespace and um, the namespace responsible for generators and properties. Using what, we just, what we've just required, we can now define so-called property. Prop is a customary, customary name to, um, to, to name those symbols. So for all A's being ints and for all B's being ints, we claim that the, the following property holds. Notice that if you squint, it's nothing but plain mathematics. Now using 
um, the test case quick check function, we can generate 1,000 random values, pipe it into our property, and verify that everything works as expected. If we evaluate this expression, we will get the following map back. Well, this doesn't look that good. Let's take a look. Um, arithmetic exception divide by zero. Well, indeed, we never said that b cannot be zero. So we need to fix our property somehow. We need to make b's uh, exclude, well, we need to exclude zero from possible values of b. In order to do this, we will use um, such that combinator, which believes just like filter function, if you like. Given a predicate, it generates a new generator of values which match the predicate. Using gen sample, we can take a look at various at values generated by various generators. Here we can see that a generator of integers generates ints just as, as before, and our new derived generator excludes all the zeros just as we wanted. Now we can plug in our newly defined generator and take a look at um, a result value of the new property. We execute our tests again, and this time after 1,000 um, executions, test check did not find any input values which would contradict what we claimed in the property. But as you remember, in our original test, we used doubles as well. Let's extend our test so that it covers doubles as well. Less the version of test check I saw didn't have a built-in generator of doubles, so let's write one on our own. Fmap is something like map, but for generators. Here we are mapping the double function over generator of integers. And as the sample function will show us, we get integers mapped into doubles. Once again, we have to exclude zero, so we use our um, old friend such that to exclude all the zeros, and this time we have a new generator with doubles excluding zeros. We plug both gen generators into our test case. We run 1,000 tests, and the result is false. What's happening there? Well, if you take a look at the fail key, you will see value 23 and 21. This is A and B for which the test failed. Well, this is puzzling. Let's take a look at what's happening inside. Well, indeed, if we plug those values directly into the test, it's false. So what's the actual value? Well, it turns out that what we run into is the fact that on our computers we used on a daily basis, operations on floating point numbers are not exact. And our claim about equality of those uh, divisions and multiplications was not right. And this is something generative testing excels at. It comes up with all the crazy possible combinations of input values and subjects your properties to, to a hail of tests. And then it gives you a ready input value to consider for debugging. A wonderful tool. Now I'd like to show you something different. Let's talk about reverse. If we want to test a reverse function, once again, we have to think about some property it holds, something general. Well, for certain sequences, like lists or vectors, reversing a reverse collection is the same collection. It would be excellent if we could just test it this way, but there are reasons for which this does not work. Instead, we can write it this way that for arbitrary collection, reverse of a reverse of a collection is equal to the original collection. This time, I'm going to write a proper closure test namespace to test this behavior. Let's write, um, let's create the project core test namespace, and let's assume the following partially correct implementation of reverse. Um, we will need the def spec macro, which corresponds to a closure test def test macro. Using it, we will um, write what follows. Property of reverse composed for all collections being lists of integers. I claim that collection is equal to reverse of reverse of collection. Let's run it. We can run it using standard 
core standard um, closure test tools. The map says that the property doesn't hold. And the failing case under the fail key is zero, a list consisting of just zero. Well, it makes sense. Notice also the seed key. This is the um, random seed which is used to well, seed the random generator, which subsequently generates values for our test cases. On new execution, a new seed will be generated, and, it will be, and our test will be subjected to a different sequence of test cases. Let's try this now. This time, test check found a different test case, different failing scenario. It's a list 2, 1. And now, let's take a look at this part of, of uh, the part of the map which I've been ignoring so far. Let's, let's take a look at the shrunk submap. Shrunk uh, contains the result of so-called shrinking procedure. Shrinking is a minimizing the failing test value. How it works is that after, after quick check and specifically test check, after finding a value for which the test does not hold, it uses certain properties of generators to find, to make those values smaller and smaller, minimize them, and find the minimal value for which the test fails, and then gives you this minimal failing case. Now, I can't find words to describe how awesome this is. Instead of, let's, let's assume you've got a domain where you represent, your, um, you represent your domain using some nested maps, potentially recursively nested maps. Test check will not throw at you five megabytes of a data structure saying, debug that. Instead, it will do its best to minimize it to a minimal map, making your test fail. Again, automation. This is exactly what a human would do, right? We would try to figure out what is actually the minimum scenario for which our logic doesn't correspond to the specification. It's done automatically for us. It's outstanding. It seems that so far test check is an excellent tool as long as your domain is expressible using lists and integers. Arguably, most domains can be expressed this way, but let's take a look at something more applied. Let's take a look at style fruits. Um, at style fruits, we are maintaining multiple uh, or several services in Clojure. One of them is our main website. This system has quite a complicated routing logic. This logic has been a source of many bugs, regressions, internal um, conflicts, and other problems. We wanted to rewrite it, and we wanted to get it done right at this time. We also wanted to have a comprehensive test suite, which will make, it, make sure that this time no bug is left behind. Property-based testing was a natural candidate for this problem. We decided to hide entire implementation of our new routing and route, well, routing and route generation behind a simple API, exposing just two functions. Path to descriptor, where descriptor is a data structure representing a given mm, page on our website, and a corresponding um, uh, function for generating strings. How would we attack this problem? How would we generatively test it? Well, reverse. Once again, this shows a very similar property to the reverse case. Assuming that we have the same context, composing those two functions yields a, an identity function in the domain of paths or descriptors. So let's test it. What we wrote looked as follows. For all descriptors generated by our custom generator of valid descriptors and for all contexts, the following equality, which I just described, should always hold. The number of bugs, the number of regressions this single test has uncovered in our implementation is unbelievable. And it's also a wonderful tool for test-driven development. If you're into writing tests, seeing them red, implementing something, seeing them green, you'll love this. What you do is you write a generator, you write a property, 
and it just will keep giving you more and more failing scenarios until you will get your implementation right according to your claims. And when you're done, you just extend your generators to a broader domain of your problem, to a well, broader subset of your domain, or write more properties. Works like a charm. It worked for us like a charm. Let's take a look at uh, some other use cases. In his talk, John Hughes, one of co-authors of um, QuickCheck, uh, discusses a lot of interesting topics. Among them, a um, problem they found in, I believe, um, Volvo, well, some car manufacturer, where they uh, in an internal bus in which a message in, uh, in which messages are being sent around um, between various subsystems of the car, they found quite a life-threatening bug thanks to generative testing. Very interesting talk. I really recommend checking this out. A word of warning. If you watch this talk, you won't feel safe in your car anymore. Another use case. Um, Kyle Kingsbury and his work on distributed databases. Jepson. If you're not familiar with uh, Kyle's work, um, what he does is he subjects distributed databases to automatically generated sequence of operations executed concurrently, and um, then introduces glitches in the network connecting those databases. And then figures out whether, and checks whether the database holds promises it should guarantee in such scenarios. A really interesting talk and a really interesting and very real world, very applied application of generative testing. A word of warning. If you watch this talk, you won't feel safe using your database ever again. Fine. We see how um, certain people use generative testing for some really complex and uh, interesting problems, but how do they do this? Well, in order to um, understand how do they do this, we have to dig into the world of things which are rather taboo in the closure. Let's talk about state. In order to taste stateful systems, generative testing um, works on a bit different basis. Originally in, uh, introduced in a talk from 2000, uh, from, in a paper from 2006, uh, stateful generative testing was, uh, was used to test large telco systems at Ericsson. Ericsson was, I believe, the first customer of the startup um, founded by creators of QuickCheck. Very interesting paper in which they uh, go in, in detail into how, they, how their tool works and how it, is, uh, how it can be applied to a really complex domain. Instead, I will just, instead of discussing it in detail, I will um, present a simple example. The general idea behind testing stateful systems with generative testing works as follows. You generate a sequence of actions which you apply to the system under test, thus mutating its state. At the same time, you keep track of all the, um, all the changes in your internal model of the system. And after each application, you verify that the state of the system is just as the model, uh, just as the model suggests it should be. Let's take a look at a concrete example once again. Something simple. In our case, our mutating state will be simply a variable pointing to a closure vector. And what we want to determine is whether applying conj and pop operations will, um, whether conjoin adds to the end and pop removes from the, from the beginning. In order to test the system, we will maintain our, our vector and the variable pointing to it. And at the same time, we'll keep track of elements in the vector in a separate collection. And after each application of either conjoin or pop, we will check that um, elements in the vector are identical to elements in our model of the vector. 
let's generate a couple, uh, let's uh, require a couple of namespaces. Let's uh, use devspec, which we've seen before, and generators, and a new library, which I'm introducing on this slide, called states, which does all the uh, hard work for us for, um, related to generating sequences of operations. Let's define the following test case. Uh, property of vector operations is defined using the state's run commands function. Uh, commands, next step, and post conditions, that's a lot of arguments. I will discuss them in detail. Also, there is the map, which um, stores the um, initial version of, this, of the well, initial state of the system, which is an empty vector. Commands is a generator of actions, of operations, which will be applied to our system. It looks quite complex. It takes as an argument, uh, as its argument, it takes the state of the system under test. Instead of going into detail of, uh, of, of its implementation, let's take a look at the sample of values it would return. As you can see, given a state in which vector is symbol A and um, a list of elements we keep track of is one to three, it generates the following sequence of uh, simple closure S expressions which would be applied to the vector. Next function to discuss is next step. As its arguments, it takes the state of the system under test, a variable to which the, last resu to the result of last operation was assigned, and the last operation which was executed. We will dispatch on the operation which, uh, which has been just executed. If it's conjoin, we will add an element which was added to the list, to our internal model. And in case of pop, we will do the reverse. We will drop one element. In both cases, we will keep track of the variable to which, uh, we will keep track of the variable pointing to our vector under test. Finally, post condition is the place where our assertion is. It takes as, as its arguments the state of the system, the command which is executed, and value returned by this command. In this case, we care only about the pop case. If the, the operation was pop, we expect that the returned value is identical to our internal model of the system. If it's not pop, we assume everything is all right. Let's run our test and see what's happening. It fails. Post condition unsatisfied. This, the system was in the following state. Elements minus two, seven minus one, and vector being variable two. In the fail vector, you see a sequence of operations, which led to um, the post condition being unsatisfied. If the collection of operations was, long, was longer, thanks to shrinking, it would be minimized to a smaller, hopefully minimal, uh, sequence of operations, which reproduces the incorrect behavior. What's wrong? Well, it turns out that um, I made a mistake in both condition. In fact, I made a mistake elsewhere. I keep track of elements of the vector in a list, and I conjoined elements to the front of the list, instead of in, um, adding them to the end. What fixes the problem is reversing elements in the equality check. With such a small change, I can rerun my tests, and this time, after 100 of random um, executions of various sequences of commands against my state, everything is all right. If you'd like to check out some mm, more complex scenario of this method of testing. I recommend taking a look at the project which uh, was uh, mentioned uh, uh, already today, namely uh, Michal Marczyk's C-trees. This time, however, uh, I'm not interested in the uh, implementation of the library, but its tests. In the test namespace, Michal uses uh, generative testing to generate sequences of operations which he executes against his implementation of the map and another standard library implementation. And finally, he compares whether both maps are identical. 
this way, maybe not guaranteeing, but increasing the likeliness that his implementation is correct as well. On top of this strategy of testing stateful systems and generating operations to execute against your system and the model of the system, you can build even more complex things. In the talk which I've um, mentioned once already today, um, John Hughes introduces, uh, goes into detail of um, generating concurrent sequences of operations and applying them to the state in multiple threads at the same time. And afterwards, checking whether the system under test um, still holds its promises in case of any potential um, race conditions happening within the system between those concurrent threads. What you get in turn is nothing but automated detection of race conditions. Uh, John Hughes company offers um, commercial support for uh, a product and commercial support for um, testing of such systems, testing such um, parallel models. Um, but in, in, in his talk, which, I'm, uh, which I encourage you to take a look at, he discusses um, very interesting applications. He starts with very simple uh, cases, some ticketing machines, and then goes to applications such as um, details, some really low-level uh, thread pool um, libraries running inside of Basho's RIAC, li uh, RIAC database, and um, tells stories of how they use such systems to find some really intricate bugs deep inside of uh, their thread pool implementation. A fascinating video. Another interesting talk uh, which I can recommend is um, it comes from, comes from last year's Euroclosure in Krakow. Philip Potter introduces generative testing and presents a, an interesting combination of, uh, of tools. Um, he, he combines um, tools for generative testing like test check with um, projects which Kyle Kingsbury uh, developed for his uh, Jepson experiments and combine, co combines them to achieve similar tools uh, like, uh, like ones offered by John Hughes company, namely automatic detectors of race conditions in your closure applications. I really recommend a very interesting talk, very interesting solution to a difficult problem. If you'd like to learn more, uh, there is a lot of reading material. Uh, no need to take pictures. Slides will be in the internet uh, momentarily. Mm. First two links are two closure libraries, which implement this idea of stateful testing using generative testing. Um, two following uh, links are Erlang implementations, also very interesting, very illustrative. Um, and then, finally, uh, in the blog post section, we have um, an experience report covering this, this story which I've already mentioned about using QuickCheck to find uh, race conditions in um, thread pool implementations. Then, um, Yellow Rat blog. Um, there you'll find a very interesting list of tips, tricks, uh, links to interesting materials, links to interesting uh, libraries, all dedicated to being more effective at using your, um, at using uh, generative testing for, um, for checking your code. And then if you have long commutes and are, um, are into podcasts, I recommend um, downloading the quick check episode of Mostly Erlang podcast, which uh, is an interview with John Hughes, uh, where he mm, tells interesting stories about how uh, his work on uh, the quick check has, uh, has begun, including the fact that the initial version 
of the quick check paper got rejected and uh, after being finally published, after 10 years got a uh, prize for the most influential paper of the past decade. Very interesting podcast, a couple of interesting stories and uh, one hour well spent. I hope that in this short talk, um, I was able to, to convince you that uh, generative testing is a viable alternative or a viable um, complement uh, to traditional testing methods. Instead of specifying unit tests one by one, you just define a more general, broader properties, and use tooling which automatically will verify your properties by subjecting it to a hail of test cases. If something is wrong, you will get back a minimal example showing you where your system doesn't match your specification. On top of those simple foundations, you can build even more powerful tools. You can build things which test stateful systems, real-world systems. And finally, making them concurrent, you can, you can use the same tool to automatically detect race conditions in a really complex software projects, just like uh, Kyle Kingsbury is doing in his Jepson work. What lies beyond that? This is a question I've got to you. This is all I've got. Thank you all very much.